I'm Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast and welcome to another edition of the Chicken Head Chronicles. Now a couple of weeks back I posted on Twitter and on Facebook about how I found a really sweet deal at a local surplus store in Tucson called EE Surplus where they sell everything from avionics equipment, which is like 25 or 30 percent of their business, to old oscilloscopes, uh, old VHS players. They have a ton of laser disc players. I I'm going to do a whole episode just dedicated to EE Surplus and the cool stuff they have there. It's really a fun shop. But now and again, they get good, cool Commodore equipment in. Now, this is where I got my Commodore Pet, which you see. Uh, right there. I picked that up a couple of months ago, wandering through the store, didn't find anything I was particularly interested in, thought well, I'll do one more check, boom, there it is, the bottom shelf, a Commodore CBM 8032 in flippin' mint condition, so I'll snap that puppy up. I've already done a video uh, showing that off a couple of times. Uh, so I put my name on a list, so if any Commodore equipment comes in, just give me a jingle. Let me, I'll let you know if I'm interested. So I got the call the other day, and the guy said he got a Commodore 128 in and two other boxes of stuff. I thought, okay, sounds good. He quoted me a price for it. Uh, sounds a little steep, but I'll come down and take a look. They wouldn't put a hold, but I'll come down and take a look. Two boxes was five boxes because he forgot to mention it came with a monitor and it came with a printer too. So suddenly the price that he quoted me over the phone didn't sound half bad. So I went down there. I snapped this stuff up faster than you could blink your eyes. Now, I'll be honest, I don't need it. I really don't. I have two Commodore 128 flats right now that work fine. One of them has a bad key, but I'm, I'm, I'll fix that eventually. And I've got my precious Commodore 128D that I got from John Kennedy from uh, CommodoreForever.net. I love it. I use it all the time. It is my go-to machine for doing Commodore 128 stuff, and my 64C is my go-to machine for my basic Commodore 64 uh, gaming and things like that. But I couldn't pass it up. The main reason being, I want to get this into the hands of people who will truly appreciate it. No, not free. Don't even think about that. I'm not giving it away in a charity auction or anything like that. But I'm going to take it out of the boxes, take a good look at it, make sure it's in good shape. I will probably end up putting some nice uh, heat sinks in there to uh, replace the the, the 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 heat shield that they put in there right now which is like an rf shield with a little couple of metal clips down touching some of the important chips i'll probably do a little heat sinking um, generally clean these things up get them ready for sale to people who will really and truly appreciate them so let's get busy looking at what we got most importantly, we've got the Commodore 128 here, which is in a box that's actually in pretty good shape considering it's 35 years old. It's not bad shape. Then we got two, count them, two 1571 drives. Absolutely beautiful shape on those boxes. Then um, the monitor, I will show you in a minute. I don't have the box right in front of me right now because I have limited room in my office. And then we got this cool Star Micronics printer, which is the, excuse me box, SL10C, which I have already unboxed and I've put up there and it works absolutely flawlessly. I do need to get new ribbons because the ribbon that came with it was probably 30 years old and it's a touch dry, but man, it responds just beautifully. Just such a beautiful printer. Let's go ahead and Get the Commodore 128 unboxed and see what we've got inside. Like I said, the box is in absolutely fine shape. Little dings and scratches here and there. Serial number CA1314035. We'll make sure that matches what's inside. Now, it has all the original packing material, including the little plastic overwrap that goes over the Commodore 128 itself and all the styrofoam. Now, inside here, we have a monitor cable. Interestingly enough, this is the five pin variety, which means it's not going to be using these as 
Chroma and Luma. This is more something that you'd use on a VIC-20 or an Atari 800 or something like that, but it absolutely will function for composite output. Set that aside. Now here's a little treasure. This one goes with the monitor, the Technica monitor we're going to be taking a look at in a few minutes. On one end, it has 9-pin RGB for the 80-column mode, and on the other end, it has a, a standard 5-pin, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5-pin Commodore connection. Again, this is not... There we go. This is not the 8-pin connection, so unfortunately, this is not a Chroma Luma cable, which disappoints me terribly. But it's interesting because the cables are attached together, and on the other end, we have a standard audio and a standard video connection, composite, and a special connector that goes into the Technica monitor that allows it to work in 80-column RGB mode. Now, if this was a Chroma Luma cable that also had the RGB, I would be in heaven because this would be a perfect cable to go with the Commodore 128 in that monitor. As it is, it works beautifully. Composite actually looks gorgeous, but it's not perfect. Well, looky here. We've got classic covers made in the USA, a Commodore 128 cover. Now, you can get your current covers for your current Commodore machines from our good friend Lucas at RetroReady.one. He sells brand new uh, covers for everything from the Commodore 8-bits to the uh, Commodore uh, Amigas and, and everything in between, and even some lowly, uh, unheard of computers like the ZX Spectrum and things like that. He's got homemade covers for. His wife makes them. This one comes with one. Let's get it out of the box. And look at her. She is in pristine, pristine shape. No yellowing at all. I mean, literally, this thing looks like it's just off the assembly line. Uh, I, I can't see really any evidence of, of yellowing, although I, I could be wrong. The keyboard, perfect shape. Keyboards feel perfect. All of the keys intact. This guy took care of his machine. Over here, we've got our two standard joystick ports, our beloved reset switch, uh, power switch, and our power connector. Now, if you'll notice, when I opened the box, there was no power brick included, which made me quite sad. Luckily, I have some extra power bricks, and the Commodore 128 power bricks don't have the same problems that the Commodore 64 does. They're fused power bricks, they're uh, ventilated, and they tend to last for about a million and a half years. So when I sell this little beauty, it will come with a working Commodore 128 branded power brick. Expansion port where you put in your Commodore 64 or your Commodore 128 cartridges, which are much less common, but still available. There are a few incompatibilities in Commodore 64 mode with the expansion port. I understand there's a couple cartridges that it just isn't happy with, but in general, most work fine. Your cassette port, a serial interface for your disk drives, video interface, you see, that's, of course, the standard 8-pin that was used in the later Commodore 64s. Uh, but all of the components that came with this use a 5-pin, and they fit in there just beautifully. Here we have our RF modulator. There's absolutely zero reason to hook this little guy up to a television nowadays, not even for nostalgia. That's just too ugly. Your RGBI cable, which is in effect standard CGA or something extremely similar to standard CGA that allows you to work in 80 column modes. And I'm going to show you some cool tricks about how we can get this connector and this connector to display on an LCD screen beautifully. And then we have the user port, which is often used for things like modems. You can use this for a Wi-Fi card now to get your Commodore 128 on the internet. Just blank over here. Now, let's unbox the monitor and get this hooked up and see if it boots. The monitor is packed so nicely. Now, this is a Technica MJ22, which I honestly am not familiar with, but it's supposed to do uh, Chroma and Luma and also uh, RGB, 80-column RGB. 
Look how nicely this is packed in here. He still has the original plastic for the monitor itself, all the original styrofoam. Everything's just in great shape. I'm going to go ahead and get this out of the box, but that's something you guys don't need to watch. So we've got the Technica monitor out of the box now. I, I saved you the pain and agony of listening to me remove it from the styrofoam and the, the, the wrapping and everything. Look how beautiful it is. This monitor, it, it, it almost gives the illusion of a flat screen because of how this bezel is indented here. Every time I look at it, I see it like a flat screen monitor, but it's, it's just an illusion. It's a standard CRT with a curved screen. Let me get some different angles here, but see how that, that bezel almost makes it look a little bit flatter when you're looking straight at it. It's kind of cool actually. Now here, we've got our power switch on the right and we've got our volume control knob here on the left. This has a built-in speaker right there. Down here, we have a button for RGB or composite. Also, it works fine with Luma Chroma. You've got tint control, color, brightness, uh, contrast, vertical hold, and horizontal hold. Let's flip this around and take a look at the connections on the back of this monitor. So on the back here, we've got a switch for RG mo RGB mode one or three. Mode three is probably for something more like a uh, CGA monitor, which does not use one of the signal lines. Video input level control, which I have not played with. Switch between NTSC composite or separate video, which is the Chroma Luma option that is available for uh, some newer Commodores. RGB input, which looks astonishingly like the eight pin connector on the back of the Commodore 128, but it's not. This is for 80 pin RGB. Audio in for for your mono audio. You've got video Luma in and Chroma in if you if you have separate Luma and Chroma. If you don't, then this top one here or this middle one here is just your standard composite. Then you have these interesting outputs. Audio out and video out. Can we actually hook this up and view it on a second monitor? Well, we're gonna try it out and see and see if we can get a dual monitor solution. That'd be kind of cool. Then you've got some, some more complex controls, which are kind of nice because oftentimes these controls are locked inside of the monitor and you can't get to them. You've got uh, V-line, V-size, horizontal hold. Most monitors have these. You just can't get to them without taking the back off. Let's try and boot it up, see how it works. This is where the clever little cable comes into play. So we have our nine pin connection for our RGB and we have our five pin connection. I really, really, really wish you were eight pin. I'm gonna have to look around and see if somebody can make a custom cable like this. I mean, obviously I know they can, but I'll have to see if somebody can do it for me. And that goes right into our video connection. I'm not gonna hook up any drives quite yet. Now, let's power this all on and see if it explodes. We're going to make sure our 4080 column button is in the up position, so it'll boot into 40 column mode. We're gonna make sure our RGB composite button is in composite mode here, so we can absolutely make sure it's gonna come up in composite mode. We're gonna power it on. Power light comes on, that's good. Now let's power on the Commodore 128 for the first time in who knows how many years. Red light, okay, comes up uh, black and white. Let me just see if it's a loose cable in the back. I am officially confuzzled. I could not get it in anything except black and white mode using that cable, which as I showed you, had a five pin DIN on it, okay? So I thought, okay, maybe we've got a problem with the cable. So I used the other cable that has a five pin DIN on it. Absolutely, I guarantee five pin, not eight pin came up in black and white mode. Interesting. So I plugged in one of the other ends of the cable into the chroma jack on the back of the Commodore 128, switched it to Luma Chroma mode. It comes up okay. I mean, the colors aren't perfect, but we can tweak them. How does a five pin DIN 
cable send through the chroma luma signal. I thought it needed the other three pins to do that, but I guess I'm just confuzzled. Now we may have a little issue here with this Commodore 128. I've got the RGB connector plugged in and I'm in 80 column mode. So watch what happens here. Seems to come up okay. But occasionally when I boot it up, the entire screen will shift to the left. And of course now it's not doing it. Now it's working perfect. Ah, there we go. Everything shifted to the left. Cursor's in this weird position. Something's not quite right with the internals of the video of this Commodore 128. I wonder if we pop it open, if we're gonna see something funky. Now, I know it's not the monitor because I did hook this up to my Commodore 128D and it works absolutely flawlessly, even with this funky cable that uh, passes through just the five pins, it works flawlessly. Um, something's going on inside this Commodore 128. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. Here we are. I've got it now hooked up to my Commodore uh, or my Commodore 1902 monitor, which handles both RGB and Chroma Luma and composite. I'm using my cables, which are Luma Chroma cables. It boots up just fine. The colors, let's see. Colors look okay. Huh, let's try it in 80 column mode. Switch to 80, 40, 80 column, power it up. So far, looks good. Let's go into fast mode. Go back to white. Tell you what, I don't trust it though because I've seen this thing flake out. Let's try it a couple times. Do some resets. Okay, I think what we can deduce is that the chips are okay, but they may either not be seated correctly or something may be shorting them out in there where they act funny on occasion. But sometimes it works absolutely beautifully, but I have seen this thing go wonky. Hmm. There, now it's wonky. Now the display is corrupted. Okay. There is definitely something wrong with this Commodore 128. It looks like it could have something to do with the VDC chip, the chip that handles 80 columns. Now it's back to normal. Yeah, this is just not normal. Let's pop her open and see what's under the hood. Now the Commodore 128 just uses a standard Phillips head screws. We're just gonna get all these little screws out and we'll get the case taken apart. And I'll be back in just a second when we get this little guy opened up. And of course, inside the case, we have this RF shielding that I mentioned earlier. These little clips right here go down and touch all of the sensitive chips and provide some manner of heat sink. But over the years, these little clips tend to move and may not be providing very good heat sinking. So I may just replace everything with actual physical heat sinks. We'll take a look when we're inside here. Now look what these horrible people at Commodore did. I've got all the screws undone. I've got all the little twisty nuggets untwistified and they've got it soldered. The, the, the RF shield soldered right there by the keyboard. That's just not right. Now if you look where 
this was soldered onto the board. Where's my potentiometer? Here it is. If you look where this was soldered right onto the board, it looks like there's just a truckload of flux all around there. So I want to clean all that up. Um, I don't think it needs to be there. I've never really seen one, at least in my other two, they've never been soldered to the board. But at least this proves that it's never been opened before. Uh, here's our 128K of RAM. Now there's nothing that says this RAM is not bad and that's why we're getting a bad video display. But I'm gonna check some other things out. Here's our ROMs. All of those have heatsink paste on them. This one's supposed to be empty. You can replace that with something else. And underneath here, we're gonna find our VIC-3 chip and our VDC chip, which is giving us the problem. So let's pop that top and let's see what's up inside of there. You can see on the bottom of the plate that covers the VDC and the VIC-3 chip that there's heat sink gunk on there and a couple little tabs that are supposed to uh, uh, wick away the heat. Uh, the gunk is actually still pretty soft. It's not hardened, which is great. And then we have our two little chips here. On the right, we have our uh, regular VIC-3 chip, which handles 40 column and all the beautiful colors. And on the left, we have our VDC chip, which generally has 16K of RAM. This one has not been expanded. And this is where I'm suspecting our problems lie, is in this chip right here. So we've got the VDC, VDC chip out. This was uh, 63rd week of 1985. Now, I read that wrong because there is no 63rd week of 1985. It is the 33rd week of 1985. It's this 8563 R9 VDC chip. And we've got our socket here. Everything looks perfectly good, but I'm gonna go ahead and just give that a quick little uh, clean up with some isopropyl alcohol because it's always possible. It was just mildly shorting out and that's why it would act funky just part of the time but not full time. Now I looked at all the caps on here. Caps on a Commodore 128 are not like caps on the Amiga 600 and Amiga 1200. It never ever ever hurts to replace them and they can go bad but it tends to be less of a problem. Um, none of them are bulging though. Let's just clean up this entire area here and we're also going to clean up the chip in case there's any oxidation on here, we'll just get that cleaned right off. I'm also going to take off each one of these ROM chips and give a little cleaning underneath and then reinsert them. And um, this chip here, which is the 3585, nope, that's uh, 34th week of 1985, it's a 6526 MOS chip. We're gonna take all these chips off, just give them a little cleaning, make sure everything's hunky-dory. Well, this is happy news indeed. So I went in and I cleaned all the chips. I removed all the socketed ones, cleaned the sockets, cleaned the chips, reinserted them. Since I did that, it appears every time that I boot up, it boots up properly. I'm no longer getting those uh, crazy screens that pop up every now and again when I do the uh, 80 column mode. Although I did just see an at sign show up there that probably shouldn't be there. Interesting. Do we have the problem solved? Let's dig a little deeper and try some software and see if it all works. Now the next goodies I got were a nice pair of 1571 drives. Again, the boxes are in good shape. I wouldn't say perfect, but good. And they have in them, we've got some IEC cables here to link the drives together, which is always nice. And power cable and the original 1571 manual with all kinds of cool information in it that none of us ever really use. And then the drives themselves. Still in their original plastic, which is kind of cool. The drives seem to be in perfect shape. Here's drive one. Look, we still have the little piece of cardboard in it, the protector. The color of it is fine. I don't think any of these particularly need any retro brighting. 
Now, one of the perks about these, one of the many perks, is you can actually set the drive ID right there, which is something the 1541 should have had out of the box, but c'est la vie. Let's get this hooked up to our Commodore 128, and we'll see if these drives work. I'm gonna go ahead and unbox the other one. And look at the treasures we found in the second box. A pair of 1571 drive covers. That is really cool. Uh, it's made by the same manufacturer. And uh, cool little drive covers go right over them and protect your little guys from dust. This is probably why the equipment was in such good shape as the guy just covered everything up. We've got more IEC cables. This time, I think they might even be a touch longer. No, they're about the same time, same size. We just have a pair of them. Probably one of them went to the other drive and the other one went to the nine pin printer that came with this batch. And our power cable and another beautiful drive still in its original packing material. Have to give it to Commodore. They did pack their equipment pretty well. Now this one does not have the head protector in there, but I know there's a second head protector that I saw in another container in a manila envelope that we'll talk about later. This one is already set to be drive nine. If you can see the little dip switches right there, she's already set to be drive nine. So we'll hook the pair of them up and see if they work. Now for space reasons, I'm gonna be using my 1902 because it's already here, but we will test that Technica monitor out a little bit more. I just wanna make sure everything works. So let's power on both drives. I've got drive eight on the top and drive nine on the bottom. There we go. Had to get power to them both. We've got red lights on both, which is good. We'll power up the computer in 80 column mode. No, nope, we're in 40 column mode. Tries to read the drive, which is good. All right, let's get some Commodore 128 software and see if it works. Now, what better way to test out a com Commodore 128 than with the Commodore 128 tutorial disc? Let's take a look and see what's on it. We're gonna go with drive eight, which should be the top drive. Hmm. All right. Now, the Commodore Basic 7 has some much better commands, like we can do catalog, and it will read drive eight, and it will tell us what's on the drive without having to load it into memory. Oh, look, it's not doing it. Could be a bad disk. Nope, there we go. It's a little noisy, I'm gonna lubricate that drive. We can also use the deload command, which is the same as load comma eight comma one. We'll load that in. Not sure if I'm trusting either this disk drive or the floppy because it's uh, not quite the way it's supposed to be. Let's quickly diagnose if it's a, ooh, look at that. You can see on the floppy, there's some marks right in the center there. I don't recall if they were there before because I've never used this disc before, but it could be gunk on the floppy. Let's try a different floppy. Got a second one of these. Commodore 128 tutorial disc. Now, if I destroy these discs, it's not the end of the world. But um, you know what? If we're gonna destroy a disc, I'm gonna do a blank one. I'm gonna read the catalog off one of these that I formatted on my drive the other night and see if it's destroying disks. So catalog, no, that sounds fine. Ooh, Contiki's on there, nice. So the drive is fine. It looks like we just had a bad floppy. Let's try a second floppy, see if it works better. Catalog. That sounds a lot better. There must have been something physically on that other floppy. There we are. 
Now let's do deload. And run. And that's looking good so far. Look at those pretty colors. Thank you for helping Commodore continue its com commitment to provide the best value in powerful blah, 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 blah. So obviously the SID chip is working fine too there. We'll exit out of there. Now let's do this same thing, but we're going to do it in 80 column mode and we're going to do it from drive nine. So we're going to swap disks here. That's now going in drive nine, 80 column mode. Now you notice when it accesses the disk when you boot a Commodore 128, it's trying to auto boot it. Now, pay attention to this. We want to look at drive nine. So we don't do catalog common nine. That doesn't work. You have to do catalog disk zero comma unit nine. Now this means it could be disk one or disk two if it was a dual disk system like the pet computers have. Now the, the C64 and 128 line never really had those dual drives, but they did plan them. But if it was a dual disk drive, you could do disk one or disk uh, zero or disk one. This one means unit nine. So now we're doing a catalog of unit nine. Now, some people use the directory name to look at the directories. It works exactly the same. And look at that. We've still got corruption in 80 column mode. I am so glad that we were able to test this out. Let's try this again. There's still something spooky going on in 80 column mode on here. This time, let's do directory. Same command, just different way to use it. Directory D0 comma U9. Yeah, comes up okay. Now we're going to do the same command D load comma D0 comma U9. Sometimes it needs the comma, sometimes it doesn't. The directory does not need the comma. The loading and saving does need the comma. Now in 80 column mode, it's still going to come up in full color. Not too shabby. Your Commodore 128 personal computer. Now we've determined that the Commodore 128 tutorial disc is incredibly boring and we don't want to watch that thing. So we're going to do something fun and we're still going to test out 80 column mode by booting up Geos 128 and see how she reacts. Let's take a look. We're going to put the Geos apps in drive 9 and Geos 128 in drive 8. Now, in theory, when I hit the reset button, this should auto boot right into Geos. We've got a naked Atari 2600 joystick here. Let's power it up and see if it tries to boot into Geos. Hmm, not auto booting. Okay. You know, this, come to think of it, this may be a 1541 of the uh, software, and I think only the 1571 version of the software auto boots. Let's see what we get. Come on, Geos. It's a good sign. So far, so good. Let's take a closer look at Geos here. We know that Drive 8 is working to boot into Geos. Joystick control is working okay. Let's take a look at the configuration. It sees a 1571 in drive A and a 1571 in drive B. No expansion. That's exactly the way it should be here. We're going to quit out of there. We're going to make sure it can read drive B okay. And so far, the display actually looks okay in Geos. It's not freaking out on us. So I'm really getting confuzzled over why it occasionally goes wonky. And here's our application. Accessing drive B just fine. GeoWrite 128. Yay, create a new document. We're gonna call this one 10 mark because we call everything on earth 10 mark. And we gotta go with a nice font here. California dude, 18 point California, that's cool. Hello. 
Oh, that's an ugly font. All you happy people. Now, what would a Commodore 128 test be without some hot CPM action? Let's see what we got here. So we've got the CPM 3.0 disc. We're going to put it in drive eight. Yippee skippy. We're going to boot up in 80 column mode. And in theory, it should auto boot this. Booting. And we are in exciting 80 column CPM mode. I'll be doing a whole series on CPM. Hey, look at our CPM files. Not very exciting. So I know what you're all saying. You're saying, Doug, we all use our Commodore 128s only in Commodore 64 mode because that's how we roll. Well, you're mistaken. There's really some awesome stuff available for the Commodore 128 that I will be covering in the near future when I go over my Commodore 128D, my lovely, lovely oh, Commodore 128D. But yes, you can go into 64 mode. You can boot right to it by holding down the Commodore key when you power on the Commodore 128 and it'll boot right up into Commodore 64 mode. Or if you're already in Commodore 128 mode, you can type go 64 and then hit the Y key and it will boot you right into Commodore 64 mode. Let's take a look at a Commodore 64 game and make sure everything works properly. Do the boring old load dollar sign comma eight. See what's on here. Ghostbusters, okay. Load, comma eight, comma one. Who are you gonna call? Well, I don't know. Let's see, Ghostbusters. Let's let this load and we'll see what's up. Ghostbusters! <laughs> Come on, everybody sing. If there's something strange in your neighborhood, who you gonna call? Ghostbusters. If there's something weird and it don't look good, who are you gonna call? Ghostbusters! Okay, I'll stop. I promise, I'll stop now. Ghostbusters! And so you can see, games work perfectly well on the Commodore 128. The SID chip works absolutely beautiful. My singing voice, on the other hand, uh, I think I need a new SID chip myself. So I spent some time testing the system because it was still just acting just a little squirrely, almost always in 80 column mode. But the other symptom was that occasionally it would not start from a cold start. It would just show the Commodore 128 garbage screen that it always shows when you first boot a Commodore 128, then it clears up and it shows your ready prompt and how much memory you have and everything. But this would just stay at the garbage screen. Then I could hit reset, It'd come up in 40 columns just beautifully, work in 40 columns all day long. I tested it for hours. 40 columns, perfect, great, no issues at all. Go into 80 column mode, it would either not work at all, which was one option, or it would work for a little while and then bomb out. Uh, sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes 20 minutes, but it would always just corrupt itself. And then it got to a point where it wouldn't even show 80 column mode at all. I'd boot it up and all the, the characters would be shifted over or there'd be crazy graphics along the screen. So I, I knew it was the, uh, the VDC chip that's the problem. Um, but I ran it through these Commodore 128 uh, burn-in tests, which you'll see right there. And that's something that I'll link to in the description too when I ran the burn-in test for 80 column, now this isn't in 80 column mode, this is in 40 column mode, but it's testing the RAM and everything uh, for, and the 80 column chips, it would come up and it would say 8563, which is the main chip, was okay, but U23 and U25, it would immediately say that they were bad, immediately. These are two soldered on chips. I thought, well, 
I'm going to try something anyways. So what I did is I went up and I got my I got my spare Commodore 128, the one that has the bad function key. And I popped my VDC chip out of there and I popped it in this one. It's been working like a champ. It's it passes every test now. I can get into 80 column mode all day long it runs fine so it's a bad chip so what i'm going to have to do now in addition to replacing a key on the keyboard i'm going to have to get a new vdc chip to replace this one that's sort of works but is flaky so uh you know there's every possibility that this guy uh hasn't used this Commodore 128 in 25, 30 years. So it may have just been time that did it to it. I don't know how it could have done it, but uh, it definitely died. Now, let's take a closer look at some of the other cool things that we can do to get both 40 column and 80 column on a modern monitor. So first, let's take a look at the device. This was a gift to me from my good friend David in Arizona. David Z in AZ, as you may know him on uh, some of the uh, forums and such. Um, this one, version four by Sven Pook. I'll try and put his contact information in there and I hope he's going to make some more of these. He's only made a couple of them, but these are so cool. I hope he makes some more. What we have here, this plugs into the nine pin RGBI port. Okay, this plugs in to, of course, the 8-pin video display port. On here, we have a SCART connection. We have a little switch to switch between 40 and 80 column and a couple little doodads, but nothing particularly complex about this. Uh, I really don't know if uh, this is in the public domain or if this is proprietary by Sven Pook. Uh, we'll try and find out that information. Let's plug it in and see just what it does. So we hook up the little device to a nine pin RGBI in the back, and then this cable plugs right into our standard display port. Now, I have a nice little SCART cable here, it's huge, thick, that goes over to this SCART to HDMI converter, which is exactly the same model that we use on all of our Amigas to get uh, RGB to SCART to HDMI. These things are like less than 30 bucks on Amazon, so they're really, really reasonably priced. You can pick up a SCART cable, a good one, for 15, 20 bucks if you don't have one. They're not as common here in the States, but you can get them. Then this HDMI is going to go straight to that little beautiful monitor right there, and let's see what she does. So what we have is when the little switch is in the down position right there, and we power on the Commodore 128. Get some power to her. She should come right up in Commodore 128 mode, 40 column mode. See it says SCART, NTSC, comes right up. The image looks good. It does not look as good as the Luma Chroma on a CRT, but we can, we can accept that. You also see it exaggerates some of the um, jail bar lines that we may not see otherwise, but it's absolutely a perfectly beautiful display. Now, when we want to go 80 column, flip the switch to the up position, put our 80 column button down. Now, when we boot up with this clever little device, comes right up with an 80 column screen on a standard LCD monitor. And this is on a standard 31.5 kilohertz monitor. You don't need a 15 kilohertz because it's going through the SCART to HDMI conversion. It is a very, very, very clever way. Even if you have another way to get 40 column, this is a very clever way to get 80 column and it looks absolutely beautiful. I've had no issues with it at all. I don't have a price on this because they're not currently available, but I will try and find more information on the price and put the information in the description. So in a nutshell, the Commodore 128, the two 1571 drives, and the Technica monitor that I picked up all work pretty darn good. 
no problem with the floppy drives. I am going to clean and lubricate them because they may not have been opened and touched in 35 years. So I'll clean and lubricate the floppy drives. I'm going to put some heat sinks on the Commodore 128 chips in there and I'm going to leave the RF shielding out. But when I sell it, I'm going to provide the RF shielding with it. So if a person wants to put it back in, more power to them. I'm keeping the nine pin printer. It works just great. You're going to see that in action in a couple of weeks when I do my Commodore 128D video. Uh, and I'm going to keep the Technica monitor. Uh, it's just they're so expensive to ship. I mean, you, you ship that thing to the next county over in the United States and it's going to be like 70 or $80 shipping. Absolutely not worth it. And I have plenty of uses for the, the monitors like that. I've got plenty of machines I can use those for. And finding a monitor that has the built-in RGB and the built-in Chroma Luma they're treasures. You know, I've got my 1902 that does that. Now I've got my Technica that does that. We're also going to be highlighting in a couple of weeks some of the software that I got on this bundle too because there was a bunch of software included with it. And uh, some of it's pretty cool. Most of it is 80 column. Some of the box, most of the box stuff is 80 column and it does just a fantastic job in 80 column. So we're going to have a whole series on that. Now, on December 5th, which is coming up in just a week, unless you're watching this afterwards, in which case, look at the video in the past. I'm going to be speaking at World of Commodore in Canada, virtually speaking because of COVID, but I'm going to be doing a 30 minute seminar on productivity software for the Commodore 128. I'm going to put the link in the description. It's going to be a Zoom meeting. You're welcome to come and join in, ask questions, do whatever you want to. It's going to be a full day full of all Commodore, mostly 8-bit stuff uh, that should be pretty exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. I'd like to say thank you to my absolutely wonderful patrons, and I think that we're going to thank them in a nice 80-column basic program. Here you go. Not too bad. And because of this little device that I talked about, this little uh, video device, I'm now able to capture actual video from the Commodore 128, just like you saw, where before everything had to be captured. You know, you point the camera at the stinking computer if you want to capture 80 columns. Um, so this is kind of nice now that we can actually display an HDMI. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed uh, learning a little bit more about my discoveries. I'm glad I figured out what was going on with that VDC chip. And as you can see, it's still rock solid in 80 column mode. So we fixed the problem by replacing the chip. If you've got a spare chip and a spare computer, I'll buy it off you. Just let me know. But until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast signing out.